Just this past month, I stumbled into a crazy scene I thought your listeners would like to hear about. The end of last year, my company moved me to one of their smaller satellite offices in Minnesota. Before moving here, I'd been working out at the Atlanta branch since I started with the company. I'd been a southern boy from birth, and me and the cold never got along. As you can imagine, the second I stepped out of the airport, I was freezing my tail off. I couldn't believe anyone wanted to be outside in this weather and any longer than they had to be. When I arrived at the tail end of winter last year and was confronted with hordes of men with facial hair that had icicles hanging from it, and they acted like it was no big deal, I thought I'd been transferred to Siberia by mistake. The morning this went down was November 11th. It was the coldest day we had so far, and it just happened to be the day my car wouldn't start. The office was only located about a mile and a half from my apartment, so I could walk it relatively fast. If I was still in Atlanta, the journey would have been no problem, but this was Minnesota and the temperature was well below freezing. Before I set off, I called the office and asked if anyone was there who could pick me up, but there wasn't. I told them my predicament and they nonchalantly suggested I just walk since it was a warm day. I couldn't speak for a moment. Warm, I thought. Warm as 80 degrees. Arguing would have been pointless, so I hung up and prepared for a miserable walk to work. Once I was sure I had enough layers on, I headed out the door. I could only imagine how stupid I must have looked to the natives, wrapped up like a mummy from head to toe, but by God, I was freezing. Really all I could do was put my head down and embrace the suck, and that's what I did. I had gotten about half a mile into my trip when I glanced over to a parking lot just to the right of me and noticed a bundle of clothes at the corner of an abandoned business. My curiosity got the best of me and I walked over to see what it was. I was a few feet away before I realized it was a person. Then I got scared. I've never seen a dead body before and this person likely was in this cold. Just to be sure, I timidly approached the body and rolled it over. I was shocked to see it was a woman and she had been beaten badly about the head and face. I touched her skin and as I feared, she was ice cold. Maybe because of what I'd seen on hundreds of movies and TV shows, I thoughtlessly checked her pulse. Amazingly, there was one. It was very faint, but it was there. I checked again just to be sure and I was right. I quickly pulled my phone out and called 911. I assumed because we were so close to the police station they were able to respond so fast. The paramedics scooped her up and took off, leaving me to speak to the police. After I explained the situation they were kind enough to drop me off at the office. I was about an hour late but after I told everyone what happened, I became the hero of the office. Even though all the attention embarrassed me a little, it did feel good to have everyone's respect. When you're the new guy and nobody knows you, that takes a while to achieve. Before I walked out of the office that afternoon, I called the hospital to see how the woman was doing. It took a few minutes to get a hold of a person that knew what I was talking about, but when I had, I found out that she had survived and was doing well. Even the nurse I spoke to was amazed that she pulled through. She told me that she sees a handful of exposure cases every year and the overwhelming majority is bad off as her didn't survive. Later in the same week, she became conscious enough to tell the police how she ended up in that parking lot. She claimed that she had been waiting for a friend and she had been attacked from behind. But when I spoke to one of the officers involved with the case, he told me he believed she had been with a customer in his car and he had beaten her up and kicked her out of the car probably leaving her for dead. She had one or two arrests previously in her past, so he believed it to be most likely the same scenario. All of this was off the record, of course, like I was a reporter or something. Personally, I don't care how the poor woman makes ends meet. I'm just happy she's alive, and I hope she makes a full recovery in time to get back to her family for the holidays. Winter is long and cold up here, but fun nonetheless. 
As a child, I would stay outside all day playing in the snow and then have to soak my hands in warm water for 10 minutes just to get the feeling back in them. Stupid or not, those were the best times of my life. However, the winter I was in 5th grade, something horrible would be set in motion in my town. School would just let out for Christmas break when the first body was found. His name was Mike Keller and he was a second grader from Mount Vernon. The reports on the news said that he had been beaten severely, but he also had multiple stab wounds that were determined to be the cause of death. I can't say that the murder caused an uproar, that would come later, but it certainly got folks' attention. It didn't put a dent in my thick head. If my mom mentioned it to me, I don't recall it. My usual life continued unabated. Day after day I would spend my time playing in the snow, only taking breaks to eat and play Minecraft. Things didn't really ramp up until another kid was found. This one turned out to be from my neck of the woods. The police reports echoed that of the previous murder, although the stab wounds were far more numerous than on the body of Keller. Now was when the parents, county-wide, started taking the threat more seriously. I'm sure every kid got the same speech I did, warning of the dangers of talking to people you didn't know. When everyone would discover the truth behind the murders, it would be much more horrible than they expected. If any kid paid attention to their parents' warnings, I wasn't one of them. My mom's words went in one ear and out the other. Since the snow had long melted after Christmas Day, I had plans to meet up with friends at our hand-built forts in the woods. But when I got there, the only people around were two kids I didn't know very well. One was a seventh grader, and the other was a year behind me. He went to the same school as I did, and the rumor was that he had been held back twice. From the looks of him, the rumors were true. Despite only being slightly taller than me, he was already showing signs of a mustache. When it comes to the older kids, I didn't know much about him other than he had a reputation for being mean to younger kids, so the second I saw him, I got very nervous. The two of them, whose names I'm not going to mention here for the reason you will soon see, were acting like they were my best friends despite never talking to me before. When the older boy asked me if my friends were on their way, I foolishly told the truth. If they weren't already at the fort, they probably wouldn't be coming. This must have been the answer they were hoping for, because as soon as I said it, they began their attack. The older boy sucker punched me to the ground. I came very close to passing out. Now I know if I had, I would have been number three on their hit list, but somehow I stayed awake. I used a nearby tree to get to my feet just in time to see the younger kid pull a folding knife from his pocket. The older kid was swinging a wooden bat around. When they saw me stand up, the older boy ran up to me and swung from my head. I ducked, but he was close enough to rip a lock of hair out when the bat hit the tree above me. I figured the kid with the knife was coming after me next, so I booked it out of there. My legs were still a little rubbery, but I knew if I stopped I was dead. The older kid was right on my heels and my lungs were burning terribly. However, I was fortunate to live on the edge of the woods and made it inside my house before they caught up with me. I ran into my mom and I breathlessly tried to explain what had just happened. She understood enough to be upset and yelled for my dad to call the police. My mom quickly explained the situation to him and he relayed it to the dispatcher. The police came quick and I told them what had happened and who did it. They had no problem finding the boys. They must have known it was over for them and they both went home and waited. The brutality of the murders was taken into consideration and it was decided to keep them in custody until their trials. Naturally, the DA wanted to try them as adults, but they were just a bit too young. Since each boy was blaming the other, despite both being responsible, they were tried separately. Neither showed any remorse, and as a result, they were given life for each murder and 15 to 25 for the attempt on my life. Had this happened just a few years earlier, they both would have been likely given life without parole for each murder charge. But recent legislation states that an offender cannot be given such a sentence if they committed their crime as a youthful offender. <laughs>
ultimately the legislation mattered not. Both boys were transferred to the adult system at 21, and because of crimes they committed inside, they probably won't ever get out. And that's the way that I like it. It was glaringly obvious to everyone around at that time that they weren't right in the head. It's just terrible that two young boys, and almost me, had to lose their lives before something was done about it. I've taken my yearly journey to the woods to hunt since I was 14. Last year started just as every other one before had, but it would end much earlier and in a very different way than usual. Despite the weather being too warm for hunting, I was out at dawn, on opening day like always. As the season drags on, the deer get more skittish, so starting as early as you can can increase your chances. On the land I've been hunting on for the past seven years, I had a small handful of preferred spots, and this is where I was heading. This spot was a tree stand setting roughly 30 feet high in an old oak that looked down across one of three feed plots. I had good luck there more than once and hoped to have it again. The drive out to the stand took about 15 minutes from my cabin, so I left an hour before dawn. I wanted to be on the stand just as the first bit of light broke. As usual, I parked my four-wheeler about 50 yards away and walked the rest of the way in. I'm not sure if it makes any real difference, but not making a bunch of noise right next to where I'd be hunting seems like a wise idea, so it's a practice I try to remember to do each time I hunt. Although I'd been up over an hour and had a couple of cups of coffee, I was probably a little groggy. I've never been a mornings type of guy, and once I retired, I've gotten up when I woke up, no certain time. So I slung my rifle onto my back and began to climb. About three steps from the top, with the seat in sight, one of my feet slipped from the ladder and I fell about 25 feet onto my back. Somehow my rifle ended up next to me rather than under. There was no pain at first, so I figured I'd just get up and dust myself off. However, I discovered very quickly that at least one, if not both, legs were broken. As I set up to examine my legs, pain began shooting through my back and body. It appeared then that in addition to broken legs, I had a major back injury. My usual high pain tolerance was letting me down, and the adrenaline was beginning to wear off. I knew in a matter of minutes I was going to be screaming in pain. I began feeling for my phone and soon found it in my chest pocket. Luckily, I didn't land on my chest right. Being out in the middle of nowhere didn't necessarily mean there wouldn't be any cell service. In my neck of the woods, cell towers are more common than trees. I dialed 911 and waited, but the call dropped. The pain was making me very nauseous and I was having a hard time concentrating. It took me a moment to realize I was going to need to move if I had a chance of getting help. I couldn't think of any other way, so I gritted my teeth and rolled over onto my stomach. The pain very nearly caused me to pass out, but the stars soon passed, and I began pulling myself forward with my arms. I had made it around 15 yards before I was forced to take a break. Once I had pulled myself together, I tried to call 911 again, but it was a no-go. I looked around and noticed I was still under the trees, but there was a clearing not far away. I gritted my teeth again and pulled myself toward it. I had to take a couple of breaks, but eventually I was in the open. I crossed my fingers and pressed send. The wait was agonizing, but it finally began ringing and I was connected to a dispatcher. The pain made the wait for help to arrive seem even longer, but because of my location and clear directions, they made it to me within 30 minutes. As I laid there, I watched the sun rise, thinking how beautiful a scene it was to see. I only wished it was under better circumstances. By the time I was released from the hospital a few days later, I would have two broken legs and a broken back, which really was crushed vertebrae. The legs would just have to heal with time, but with my back, I've had to have a couple of those vertebrae fused. The surgery was done just a few months before this year's hunting season started, and you can be sure I was there, waiting for the sun to rise on the first morning. 
One thing has changed, however. For the time being, I'll be hunting from a blind on the ground. There's no way I'm going to go another year with an empty freezer. The arrival of cold weather is a thing I can look forward to every year. However, the season has carried with it a tinge of pain for the last few years because it was about this time, in 2014, when I lost the love of my life in a horrible car accident. Melissa and I had met during my second year of college. She was a year behind me and would often seek me out when she had questions regarding her classes. I finally told her, more in a joking way than anything, that if I was going to keep helping her with schoolwork that she was going to owe me a date. To my surprise and joy, she agreed, and we were soon living together. We had our shares of ups and downs for the next few years, but managed to stick it out until graduation. Once we were both out of school, we made the next step and were married the following June. We weren't in a hurry to have any kids. We both had new jobs and lacked the security we would gain with time. When the time did come, we proudly announced the impending arrival of our first child, a boy, just days after our third anniversary. On the last week of March 2011, Jason Jr. came into our lives kicking and screaming, and I've never been happier. As you can imagine, life was hectic for a while. Not until 2013 did we have the energy to go for one more, which we decided at the time would likely be our last. Having more wasn't out of the question in the future, but for now it seemed wise. It didn't take long before we had a new one on the way. Another boy, according to the doctors. The news of another boy on the way had me elated, but I couldn't help feeling that my life was going too well. Despite my misgivings, I went ahead into life with both feet. After an especially grueling summer, the arrival of fall was a welcome change. Halloween was fun, and Thanksgiving was the perfect excuse to gorge on food I wouldn't usually eat the rest of the year. We did decide to skip the Black Friday sales, choosing rather to begin our Christmas shopping the day after. The carnage involved has always struck me as stupid, so I put it off as long as I dare each year. Melissa thought it may be less hectic if we left Jason Jr. with his grandparents, and I agreed. They would surely love to spend some time with him, and we would be able to blow through the stores much quicker if it was just the two of us. I'm sure she added the last part for my sake. She was well aware of how much I hated holiday shopping. The night prior had been a hard freeze and many sections of the road were dangerously slick because of the a-holes that left their sprinklers on. I was very aware of the danger that this posed and drove as defensively as possible, but unfortunately it wasn't enough. Melissa and I were discussing something, so I didn't see this big patch of ice at the curve ahead of us. We had just exited off the highway, so we were still going pretty fast. Just a little way down the road was a curve, and one side of that curve dropped off about 65 feet, almost straight down. I knew it was there, but I wasn't paying attention. The area going into and out of the curve was a giant sheet of ice, and I didn't see it at the time. When I did, rather than just let off the gas, I reflexively tapped on the brake. I estimate we were still going around 45 miles an hour when we hit it. Because of my stupid driving, we slid quickly sideways, hit the curb, and flipped down the hill, spinning the whole time. Since I didn't have my seatbelt on, I was thrown from the car, which was a 2004 Isuzu Rodeo, and knocked out. I'm still unaware of how long I was unconscious, but it couldn't have been long. When I opened my eyes, I realized I was at the top of the hill. I strained to turn my head to see where the car had stopped and eventually caught sight of it laying upside down at the bottom of the hill. The roof had been crushed flat with the body and I couldn't see Melissa moving. I hoped at the time that she had also been thrown and survived, but she had not. To make things more horrific, the rodeo caught fire a few minutes later and there was nothing I could do but lay there with a broken body and watch my wife and future child burn up. 
possibly even alive for all I knew. All I could do was sob uncontrollably until I passed out again. I wouldn't regain consciousness completely until that night. The pain I was feeling could only be matched by the grief I was feeling from the loss of my wife and child. I called for the nurse and she came in and showed me how to work my morphine pump. Once I was aware of it, I found myself pushing the button often. Around midday the following day, I spoke to the doctors and then the police. The doctors informed me that I had broken both of my legs, three vertebrae, and had a concussion among many other injuries. Needless to say, I was going to have a long, hard road ahead of me. The police had even more bad news to share. I hadn't bothered to ask about Melissa's condition. I knew if she would have made it, somebody would have said something. My hopes that she had been thrown free of the car were shot down. The only positive thing, which you really can't call positive, was that she and the child had died on impact with the ground. I attempted to soothe myself with the knowledge that they at least hadn't burned alive, but it proved to be cold comfort. Jason Jr. stayed with my folks during my holiday stay, and once I was released, they stayed with me a while to help me until I could function on my own. I'm not going to say much about the funeral. It's still too painful of a thing to recall. Since that time, I've undergone two back surgeries and foresee at least one more in the future. I was ruled to be disabled by Social Security and now live off the benefits I receive. I'm also able to make a little on the side, doing tax consulting so Jason Jr. and I get by okay. Jason Jr. was still too young to really remember his mother. However, now that he's at that age to be aware of her absence, I tell him all I can about her. Make sure he knows how much she loved him and maybe in a few years, I'll tell him about his little brother too. Every day I'm reminded of how much I lost that day, but then I realize how much I have gained. My time with her may have been brief, but every moment of it was great. We created a beautiful and bright boy together. I'd say we did pretty good. I think Jason Jr. and I are... We're gonna... We're gonna be... All right. This happened to my dad back in the 60s when he was a kid. He grew up with a brother and his parents in the rural part of Michigan. I had asked him once or twice about his younger brother when I discovered he'd had one. This is the story he told me of why he was missing from our lives. This is, in his words, more or less. We were the example of Hicks when I was growing up. My great-grandparents had come over from Sweden back in the 1800s and nobody had left the farm since then except to fight in Europe. Our lives depended on the weather and what the land could provide for us. We didn't even get electricity until I was eight years old. We did have automobiles, but they were usually old and worn out by the time they got to us, put together with bailing wire and stuff like that. Well, my little brother Bill and I went out one morning, I think it was early February, to go hunt some rabbits for the pot. That should give you an idea of how poor we were back then, but Bill and me, we didn't know any better. We never had to be asked twice to go hunting. That morning was incredibly cold and it had snowed two or three inches overnight. I had on almost every bit of clothing I owned, and so did Bill. It was about nine before we left the house. We were headed to the woods that sat across the lake. The woods took up about 30 acres of our 50, and it was chock full of game, big and small. I was carrying the 410 and Bill had the 22. Both of us had our pockets over full with extra ammo. Ammo was one of those things even poor folks had a lot of back then. We were kind of in a hurry because we got started later than normal and I wasn't paying as close attention as I should have been. Between sunup and when we left, it had probably warmed up about at least 20 degrees. We hadn't made it a hundred yards before we turned back to shed some layers. Mama yelled at us to stop fooling around and get to hunting so my mind was on getting to the woods as fast as possible. It took us about 10 minutes to reach the lake. The layer of snow on the top of the ice had already melted leaving the ice slicker than normal. 
Under normal circumstances, we would have stepped lightly as we crossed so as not to end up on our butts, but this morning we were running late. I slipped a couple of times and Bill, who was behind me a few steps, had to hold onto my coat to stay upright on a few occasions. I could see tracks leading into the trees as we got close and my pace began to pick up. It was about 20 yards from the end of the ice when I heard a loud bang quickly followed by a splash. I looked back to check on Bill, only to see that he disappeared. I saw that a hole had broken through the ice roughly two feet across. It was clear what had happened, so I did something that probably wasn't very wise and threw myself onto the ice. I jammed my arms into the hole, reaching all around it, feeling for one of Bill's hands or arms. It didn't take but less than a minute for my arms to start screaming in pain from the cold water. I began panicking because I knew every second he was in that ice cold water he was less likely to come out. I didn't want to take my arm out of the water but I knew I couldn't stand the pain one moment more. I stared at the hole, hoping to see Bill pop out of it while I rubbed the feeling back into my arms. I was just about to give up when I got the idea to break off a long tree limb and stick it down in the hole. I found one and it took me a few seconds to break it, but once I had, I ran back to the hole and stuck it into the water. I'd switch sides of the hole every few seconds, hoping I'd feel him grab onto the stick. I carried on with this for a couple of minutes until I realized it was pointless. There was nothing else I could do but run home and ask my papa for help. I still had that last shred of hope that he would find a way to save him. But when I ran into the house and told them what happened, his face said it all. Seeing that expression on his face stripped me of that last shred, and I collapsed onto the floor and bawled like I never had before. It only got worse when Mama came in the room and Papa gave her the news. Her wailing only made my sadness and guilt, yes, guilt, that much worse. At some point that day I began to get an idea in my head that my folks may blame me for Bill's death. They had both told me more than once that my job was to protect my little brother and I had screwed it up. After crying myself to sleep that night, the next morning I was terrified to leave my room. I wasn't sure what was going to happen to me. All kinds of ideas were swirling around in my head. At one point, I had even convinced myself that they'd give me away to an orphanage for being such an awful son. It took my folks a few hours to convince me to come out, and I only did when they promised that they weren't mad at me. That didn't stop me from apologizing when I saw them. They said it was just a terrible accident, and nobody was to blame. We all broke down after that and held each other and cried for a long time. That scene would be played out a bunch of times over the next few weeks. The thing that made things more painful, perhaps, was the wait for the lake to thaw before we could find Bill's body and bury it. Finally, around the last week of April, it had warmed up enough to retrieve his body from the lake and have the funeral. Mama and me cried most of that day. It wasn't until around the time you were born that the two of us were talking and thinking back to those days that Mama admitted to me that she felt guilty too, since she'd sent us out that morning and told us to hurry. We both came to the conclusion that moment neither of us were truly at fault. It was nothing more than an accident we were helpless to prevent. To tell the truth, on any other February day that lake would have been frozen three feet down and hard as a rock. It just happened it was one of those once-in-a-lifetime days it wasn't. I can't speak for Mama, but that day was when I was finally able to let go of all my guilt once and for all. Well, Junior, that's most of it that I can remember. File that away in your mind somewhere safe, because I ain't telling it ever again. And those were the words that he told me, and I was at a loss for words. I'd never in my life heard my dad be so open about his life and upbringing. I had known he'd been pretty poor, but that was it. In the silence, he drifted off somewhere into his past, now unaware of my presence. Dredging up all of that grief had turned his eyes red and filled them with tears. 
I decided I'd slip quietly out of the room to leave him alone with his memories. My dad and I had our share of clashes and have often went long periods not speaking to one another, but after hearing that story, I was able to see him in a bit of a more positive light. I realize now, even someone as hard as a rock like him can hurt deep down. I realize he's as human as the rest of us. The following is an account of a terrified child and how he learned to overcome the trauma that had caused it as an adult. Mom and Dad had to go out of town for a reason I don't exactly remember now and they left with my dad's mom, Granny Pearson. Granny P, as she was called, lived on a farm way out in the middle of nowhere in Kansas. My dad and his two sisters had grown up on the farm and I spent most of my first seven years of my life there myself. It was some point between January and February when this would happen. I remember a really bad ice storm had just blown through the area. The loud bang coming from the trees snapping under the weight of all the ice made me jump out of my skin a few times before I got used to it. There was just Granny P and I around then. Grandpa P had just died before I was born, and this left Granny P the only person living on the farm full time. She was a big woman. Not fat, really. Stocky more than anything, but a very kind woman. I would often go to her after my mom had told me I couldn't have something and she would usually give it to me. When my mother told me I'd be staying with her for a few days, I was ecstatic. I got dropped off early on Friday morning and the plan was for me to stay until Sunday afternoon. Granny P made us breakfast and then we spent the rest of the day watching TV and playing games. After supper, we did more of the same until bedtime. The bed was made for me in my dad's old room and she kissed me goodnight on my forehead. The next morning, I woke up really cold and the sun was already up, which was weird. Although she never ran the Dearborn heaters at night, Granny P was always up before me turning them on to make the house warm and cooking breakfast. She would allow me to stay in bed until the food was ready and wake me up when it was time to eat. This morning, none of that had happened. My curiosity overtook me and I ran down the hall to her room. When I opened the door I could see she was still in bed, so I jumped onto it to wake her up. I pushed on her several times, but she didn't move. I did it a few more times and still nothing. I wasn't sure what to do. I was hungry and very cold and I did the only thing I could think of and crawled under the covers with her, but I couldn't get any warmer. My seven-year-old mind couldn't grasp what was happening, but I knew things weren't right somehow. I'd soon give up where I was at and go put my coat on, then eventually every piece of clothing I had. The shivering had stopped, but I was still very uncomfortable. You could see your breath every time you exhaled, but I was helpless to do anything to fix it. Since I couldn't do anything about the cold, I went into the kitchen to search for something to eat. At my age, I didn't know how to cook, but I'd watched my mom make PB&Js enough I thought I could do it myself. I dug through the cabinets for several minutes before I came across an old jar of peanut butter, but no matter how hard I looked, I couldn't find any jelly, so I did the best I could with what I had. I made three peanut butter sandwiches and poured myself a glass of milk. I took the sandwiches and milk to the living room and watched cartoons. In between bites, I look over at the Dearborn heater trying to figure out how it worked, but I just couldn't. When I finished my sandwiches, I went back into Granny's bedroom to try again and wake her up. I was hoping she had been more tired than usual, but was now rested and ready to get up. When I pushed on her this time, her body moved very stiffly like she was frozen. She still wasn't waking up and the way her body moved made me suspicious that something may be wrong with her. Since my parents had taught me how to dial 911 if there was an emergency, I picked up the phone and dialed it. But for some reason, likely due to damaged lines because of the ice storm, the phone didn't work. This was when I was finally forced to acknowledge that I may be in trouble. I knew something was wrong with my granny, and it was only going to get colder when the sun went down. Yes, I had enough food to make it until Sunday, but I wasn't sure if I'd be able to stand up to the cold. 
Not to mention Granny was sick and needed help from an adult. There wasn't anything I could think of to do, so I went back to watching TV. On the way, I went into my room and took one of the quilts from my bed and put it on my granny. I thought she was stiff because she was cold like me and the blanket may keep her warm while she was sick. As the hours passed, I sat occasionally shivering in front of the screen and crying. I'd never been so scared before and help was still so far away. A bang made me jerk awake. I wasn't sure how long I'd been asleep for but didn't see any sunlight coming in the windows any longer. My first thought was that Granny was feeling better and getting up to make supper. However, when I looked down the hall to the kitchen, the lights weren't on. I knew you couldn't cook in the dark and I didn't hear anything being moved around. Fear caused me to call out for Granny, but I received no reply. Then the banging happened again. However, this time it was followed by a familiar voice saying hello. I knew right away that it was my mom and I ran towards the back door. Mom and dad came walking through the door a moment later. I remember wrapping my arms around my mother's leg and starting to cry for joy. My dad asked me where granny was and I told him that she was sick in bed. A confused look came across his face and he went into her room only to return a moment later. The look on his face was one I'd never seen before. He called my mom over to him and whispered something I couldn't hear. She put her hand on my dad's head and said something, and then walked over to me and picked me up and held me. I wasn't sure what was going on, but the warmth of my mother's body felt amazing. She quietly asked me if I was okay, and I answered yes. Then she carried me into the living room and sat me on the couch. She walked over and did something to the heater, and voila, it was roaring with heat. It was like she'd done an amazing magic trick at that moment. She returned to the couch and sat with me while we watched TV and she messed with my hair like she often did. My dad had stayed at the back of the house talking to somebody on the phone and about an hour later I heard him talking to a couple of other men. And the men didn't stay very long and dad joined us in the living room not long after they left. We loaded up and left the farm a few minutes later. This would be my last visit for another 25 years. The last 12 hours had been a roller coaster ride of emotions. Something deep down told me not to ask about Granny P, and nothing was said about her until the following morning when Dad and Mom explained that she had died in her sleep. I was just beginning to grasp the concept of death. When they said I'd never see her again, I started crying. Because of what had gone down, I was torn between the thought of losing her and the idea that it may have happened to me if they hadn't shown up early. It wasn't until I got a little older that the nightmares began. The image of Granny P's frozen face and stiff body terrified me for many years to come, as did the terror of freezing to death alone with her dead body. It was something I tried to suppress and deal with in my own way. Not until I met my wonderful wife and she witnessed the night terrors I was experiencing that I was convinced to seek help. Several years of counseling would follow until I was able to face my fears head on and return to the house. My aunt had been living there with her children for a few years but it had been sitting abandoned for at least five. The silence and smell of the old house brought back everything. Had this been ten years before I probably would have crumbled from a panic attack but I learned how to handle my emotions since then. Soon my memory filled with all the happy events I'd experienced. Each object I saw reminded me of something wonderful I'd associated with it. I went away from the farm that day, greatly surprised and pleased. An experience I'd expected to be traumatic turned out to be the exact opposite. Since that day, I've been out to the old house several times and hadn't had any problems. Now that I've become free of the burden I carried around for so long related to her, I'm able to remember all the good memories I have of Granny P. And that is perhaps the best thing I've gotten out of all the treatment I've received. I'm not sure how common the trope of the guy who went to the store to get some cigarettes and never came back is in today's virulent anti-smoking world. However, in my youth, it was still alive and well. 
Until an incident like this occurred to a friend of mine, I'd always thought it was an excuse mothers used to explain to the children why their father had left them. To my surprise, when I was a junior in high school, I discovered how true this excuse really was. My friend's dad had been working undercover for the local police department for as long as I'd ever known. Although he would often go extended periods of time without being in contact with his family, they almost always knew he was working a case and would return when he'd completed it. Then one morning, he was just gone. It was a cold and quiet winter day, the kind most folks don't go out in, but he had insisted he was out of cigarettes and would be right back once he'd gotten them. He'd just returned home from a case that had kept him away for over four months and his family was desperate to spend quality time with him. From all appearances, he planned to return, leaving his badge and gun behind. He'd simply thrown on a light coat and drove away into the unknown. The investigation to find him was very hot for a while but would eventually fizzle out. A lot of important questions were going unanswered, mainly from the side of the police department. His wife was stonewalled at every turn, especially when it came to the nature of his cases. The department would only say that his jobs were wide and varied. After not hearing anything new and not getting the answer she wanted, for nearly two years his wife hired a private investigator who used to be a local officer hoping he'd have an easier time getting the information she wasn't. He agreed to take the case, but she went almost three months without hearing from him. Just when she was starting to think she'd been scammed by the man, she received a very important phone call. The private investigator called her down to his office and gave her all she'd been looking for, and so much more. It turned out he'd certainly been earning his money. Almost an entire month after he'd begun the investigation, he discovered that her husband had been working undercover in the state and sometime national drug trade on and off for 15 years. His most recent case prior to his death was undercover in a local meth cooking and trafficking group that had ties all the way to Mexico. When the investigation wrapped up and arrests were made, he went back home. Unfortunately, it turned out that a couple of the people involved in the trafficking had to be cut loose due to some technicality and they figured out her husband wasn't undercover. They discussed this with their connections in Mexico and said connections demanded they ended him. Generally, in the States, traffickers don't go after cops. It's always been kind of an unspoken rule, but no such belief is held across the border in order to maintain a good working relationship, they agreed. It took a short time for them to find the officer and where he lived. Then one cold and quiet winter morning, they caught him on a trip to the store. All this information was unknown to the police until around a year after her husband's disappearance. A jailhouse snitch came forth with a story he had overheard and wanted to trade it for a deal on his case. Once they heard it, he was given the deal. Now that they had the information and some names, the department moved forward by planting another undercover in the organization. Considering what had happened in the past, the police knew the suspects would be very leery, so the officer had to take his time gaining their confidence. He did just what he needed to do and eventually compiled all the proof required to end the trafficking and convict the murderers of her husband. The PI had known all about the investigation for a little while, but was unable to say anything until arrests were made. That morning, he had called her to give her all of his findings. The arrest had begun, and he was given the okay to let her in on everything he knew. The private investigator told her in his entire time in and out of law enforcement, he had never heard of a cop being allowed to stay on undercover work for as long as her husband, especially in local capacity. A couple of other narcotics cops told him off the record that they had heard that her husband had been asking to transfer out of the unit, but the transfers kept getting blocked. This last tidbit of information was quickly followed up with a reminder that the police department rarely admits when it's at fault for something, and she should give up on the idea of anyone connected to it accepting any guilt in his death. She took his advice and thanked him for all his hard work. In the following weeks, the remains of her husband would be recovered and given a proper funeral. I attended the service and it definitely had an air of bitter sweetness to it. Everyone had given up hope on him being alive long ago and 
were just happy to have him back and know what happened. I would soon go off to college and lose contact with my friend, but I did keep up on the case and was happy to see his dad's murderers were convicted. They have both since been executed and, I hope, they're burning in hell. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember to always embrace the suck.